moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. Now, if you're like me, you've probably been very blessed to go to a great number of graduations as of late. Um, I think my tally's three right now, I think. And hear all these speeches, uh, way too many speeches for one individual to hear in a week's time, but I've heard a great number of speeches. And they're all saying things that are leaving me shaking my head, going, oh no, <laughs> surely you don't think that way. Uh, like the statement, you can go out of here and be whoever you want to be. And I'm thinking, no, you can't, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, if you want to go be a rocket scientist, I'm sorry, you probably can't be that. Uh, you're probably not smart enough. Uh, so, no, you can't go out here and be anything you want to be. Um, not only that, do you probably like the brain power to be whatever you wanted to be. I did. Uh, you're forgetting God in that equation. And ultimately, you're going to be exactly who God wants you to be if you're a child of God. The thought of a preacher made my skin crawl up until about, I don't know, seven years ago. That was the last thing on my list. But today, it brings me the greatest joy and the pleasure to be a shepherd of the flock of God. So that statement, you get to be whoever you want to be, that's a lie. It comes from the world and probably your mom. Uh, it's not true. Don't believe it, okay? Steer your kids toward the idea you can be exactly who God created you to be if you will walk faithfully and follow Him. That's a better statement. So the question is, what am I going to be? Is not a good question. A better question, and I'm going to make progressions, is who am I going to be? Now that's a great question. And I actually heard that in one of the speeches that I got to hear over graduation. Who are you going to be? Uh, you can affect that greatly. You can be a person of great character by somebody that humbly submits themselves and follows Christ. You can be a person of wonderful character if you choose Christ. Here's a question. What is God's will for my life? Um, I've heard a similar phrasing of that question this week. Well, here's a better question than that. What is God's will? Period. Uh, you'll, you'll learn that it doesn't revolve around you. It, it revolves around God's glory. And once you get a grasp of that, uh, just hang on. The ride gets fun from there. Okay? Uh, first question is, not such a good question, what do we need to do? Now, I've brought it into the church. That's not the question we need to be asking the church. What is it we need to do? A better question than that is, what is God doing? That's the question, you see. That's the question we constantly need to be asking ourselves as elders, as deacons, as Sunday school teachers, and as people all across the body, what is God doing? And of course, once we discover what God is doing, then we already know what we need to be doing, right? And if you think about this, I'm getting way ahead, uh, about what is God is doing in our midst. I mean, you just think about the people who are actively involved in children's lives in some capacity right now. In fact, just kind of, I, I realize everybody's gone on vacation, but if you're just actively involved in children in a significant way, just stand up real quick. Go ahead, it's okay. Just stand up. No, just children in general. You're just actively involved in the lives of kids. Emma, you should be standing. You're, I know, I know. You know, she's responsible for planting foster kids uh, in homes. And look, look. Okay, you can sit back down. And then you just think about the number of children that we have. And you think about we just took a shot at baccalaureate and 30 seniors came and you just think about VBS and we're going to have, Lord willing, usually 100 or better kids in this building. So, you know, I'm just looking at this thinking, whoa, I know what you're doing. Uh, we just are uniquely situated 
and uniquely gifted in the area of ministering to children. Uh, and so we need to be praying, saying, okay, we see what you're doing. Now what do we need to be doing to follow in what you're already doing? Because it's God who's doing, it's God who's leading, it's God who is speaking. And you say, well, how is God speaking? Well, let me give you three primary ways. Number one, he speaks to us through his word, okay? Number two, he speaks to us through the giftings of the people. Most of y'all just stood up. And so through the unique gifting, and think about how many people are not here this morning and how few people we are, and percentage-wise, think about the number of people that we have who are just specifically gifted and are working with kids right now. So you look at the giftings because God is building this body, right? And so he's putting people in particular places within this body who he's uniquely created and gifted in specific ways to do what he's going to do. And we're always trying to catch up. But that's one of the things that you looked at. Well, what do you, what do you got to work with? Because all of y'all are like a little present that's yet to be unwrapped on Christmas morning to use your gift for God's glory, okay? Next thing is God speaks to us through God-ordained circumstances. God is sovereignly in control over the circumstances of life, whether they be good or bad. God is doing something through circumstances and that's why we have a crazy map on this wall because I want to walk you through these crazy circumstances in the lives of two different people. This is, this is beautiful because hindsight's 2020, right? And so we have hindsight. Not only do we have hindsight in this map, but we have about a 30-year period in this map. And I promise you, if you could look back over 30 years of your life and connect the dots, you would be, wow, that's crazy what God is doing in moving me, in positioning me, in placing me in certain circumstances and situations. God is at work in your life. What are you doing here? I don't know, but I can't wait to see. God is doing something in your life, okay? And so that's kind of what I want to show you this morning. Now, if you remember, Paul gets back in Acts 15 from his first missionary trip, and I'm just, we're just going to talk. There's a problem. They're trying to add something to the gospel in Acts 15. The Jews are saying, not only do you have to believe upon the name of Christ, but you also have to be circumcised. So Acts 15 is the argument. No, grace alone. You don't have to do anything, whatever, anything you want to try to add to be saved. You're saved by faith through grace. Faith alone, grace alone. That's period. That's Acts 15. Now, Paul's excited because they win the debate. The church moves forward with grace and faith alone. And so they start to head out on their second missionary journey, but then a fight occurs, a sovereign fight between Barnabas and Paul, probably more like Paul's fault because Barnabas is the kind of guy that doesn't like to argue with anybody. They argue over John Mark, Barnabas' cousin. Paul's had it with John Mark. They, he bailed on the first missionary trip. I'm certainly not leaving this building with him again. Okay? So Barnabas takes John Mark. They head off one way. Interestingly enough, a Jew who lived in Jerusalem, whose name was Silas, who believed in Christ, who also believed in grace alone through faith alone, says, hey, Paul, I'll go with you to deliver the letters. Okay? So here we are. We're way down here in Jerusalem. See Jerusalem? So once they get the letter that is grace alone through faith alone, Paul and Silas take off and they go up here to Antioch. Antioch, we know from the New Testament, is the missional-minded church. They're the ones that really bought into this. We've got to take the gospel to the nations. They sent Paul and Barnabas first. Now they're going to send Paul and Silas, this new missionary plant guy, out on the second missionary journey. So they take off and they follow not the yellow brick road. That's like the third missionary journey. They're following the purple brick road. And they get right here. Okay, to Derby and Lystra. I'm going to back out and see that? Derby and Lystra. Now, Derby and Lystra on the Purple Brick Road, they pick up a very young man who's going to change the course of Christianity as well. In fact, you'll get two books written to him by the Apostle Paul. And what was that young man's name? Timothy. So Timothy gets added to the mix. And so he, Silas and Timothy, or Paul, Silas, and Timothy take off 
Now, I want to show you three regions, all right? So we got the region of Asia. Let me back out. You see that? We got the region of Asia. We got the region of Bithynia. See that's up north. We got the region of Macedonia. That's not here. And then we've got the region of Achaia. Okay? Think four. We're primarily talking about four regions. You've got three men. Luke gets added. I'll show you where he primarily gets added. But in Acts chapter 16, they leave here, Lystra. They go to Pisidian Antioch. And now Paul wants to go into Asia, specifically the region of Phrygia, and preach the gospel. See that whole region there, the Asian region? He wants to take the gospel into minor Asia and preach the gospel. But there is a problem. Look at Acts 16, verse 6. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God in Asia. So Paul wants to go down into this region and preach the gospel in Asia and Phrygia, and the Holy Spirit says, not going to happen. So he gets back on the purple road, and he goes over here to Mysia. Now, what he wants to do at Mysia is he wants to go north and preach the gospel up north, up here in Bithynia. Okay? Well, look at the next verse, verse 7. After they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them to go. And so passing, uh, and passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Now, back on our map, Purple Road, here's Troas. Now, let me tell you something very quickly. Troas is a very special city. It's a port city. You can get to Macedonia through Troas, or you can get to Asia Minor through Troas. This is a big time city in the life of the Apostle Paul. It's like a meeting ground. It's like you can get to any, it's like Atlanta. Anywhere you want to go, you can get there from Troas. That's why it's so significant. In fact, Paul's last words were written to 2 Timothy, and on the, it's like the last verse or two in 2 Timothy. Paul says, bring my coat and the parchments when you come. I left them in Troas. So Paul somehow had a connection in the city of Troas that he, some guy he lived with and he'd leave his stuff there because he'd always know wherever he was moving or going, he would have to go back through Atlanta or Troas. Now the question, you've got to ask the question, why up here in Asia and Phrygia did the Holy Spirit say, not going to happen, and why did we get up here in Mysia and the same, the Spirit of Jesus say, no, not going to happen? Well, the reason they said that is, is because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, same thing, synonymous terms, is only doing what God is doing. The Spirit of God is not doing what Paul wants to do. The Spirit of God is doing what God is doing. We need to keep that in mind as a church. We can get really busy doing a whole lot of things, but the only thing that's important is what is God doing? That's the proper question. And so, however that happened... I, you know, I guess if you're a charismatic, you would say, well, somebody spoke to him prophetically through tongues. Or if you're a more, you know, reformed individual, you would say, well, he was studying the Word of God and he came across. We have no idea how that took place. Scripture doesn't tell us. I do know how God stopped me from going to Africa. I do know how God stopped me from going to Nepal, and I've told you all that before. I mean, we were trained, we were signed, we passed the test, we were headed toward Nepal to join a missionary, missionary team in Nepal that was working in a hospital. I was going to disciple. Paige was going to homeschool their kids. And the government moved in, closed down the whole program, sent all the missionaries home. And I still keep up with a guy on Facebook. He was one of the doctors that was already there. He's still living up in Michigan, just waiting on God to move him again. I do know how God shut that down. Perhaps it was something like that. But God says, no, not going to happen. Nepal's your plan, not my plan. My plan is to get Joey to Corinth Baptist Church in Macedonia, Alabama, not Nepal. Okay? I just had to figure this out. Now, once we get to Troas, he has a dream. The Macedonian vision, right? Here's Macedonia. The Macedonian vision. So Paul immediately assumes through this vision or dream, don't know what that looked like, I got to get to Macedonia. That's easy. He immediately hops a boat. He passes through Samothrace. He gets to the, the port city of Neapolis. He hops, he hikes it up into Philippi. 
He goes to some water because there is no um, Jewish synagogue. So he goes down to where people he would assume that would be Jews be down at the creek celebrating the Sabbath. And there was a lady there by the name of Lydia at Philippi. Okay? Preaches the gospel to Lydia. Lydia comes to faith. Lydia is a very wealthy woman because she's a seller of what color of fabric? Purple, which is very expensive dye. So we're talking about the first conversion in Philippi was to a wealthy lady. Now, what happens in Philippi? Well, Paul gets ticked off. His temper gets the best of him. There's a young lady that's prophesying behind him. You need to listen to this guy. He gets on Paul's last nerve. He finally turns around. He rebukes the spirit in this lady that's a prophetic, demonic spirit. The spirit comes out of that lady. We assume she comes to faith in Christ. But that lady was owned by two slave owners who were making money off her. So they call the police. Paul gets beaten. Paul gets thrown in prison. Paul and Silas are singing the gospel at midnight. Earthquake comes. Let's the chains loose. The jailer's going to kill himself. Paul runs in, leads the jailer and his whole family to Christ. That Philippi. Okay? Now, Philippi. We've got a rich lady who's just opened up a house church, her own home for the gospel ministry. We've got a whole family that just came to come faith in Christ. Looks like we're going to plant this church in Philippi. Philippi is the church that loves the apostle Paul. Paul could, I could just really see Paul saying, I need to hang around in Philippi. No. God says, you're moving. So they kick Paul out of Philippi. But Philippi has a purpose. So we're going to just put a pin in it, Hannah, wherever you went, because we'll come back to it. All right? So Paul gets kicked out of Philippi. He doesn't preach the gospel in Apollonia or Amphipolis, but he preaches the gospel in Thessalonica. Now, if you've got your Bibles, turn over now to Acts 17. And let me read just a little bit to you. Verse 1. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue. According to Paul's custom, he went in, and for three Sabbaths, he reasoned from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Look at this. Along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women... But the Jews became jealous and taking some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And let me sum up the rest of the passages. They began to persecute Paul and they began to run Paul out of town. Okay? Now we'll come back to Thessalonica too in just a second. Paul gets run out of town and he goes down to Berea and Berea is where he preaches the gospel. I'd kind of like to plant a church in Berea. Because the Bereans were more noble-minded, and every time Paul preached at Berea, the people would go back to the Word of God to see if he was right. I would love to preach in a place who just had such a passion for the Word of God. That's where I'd want to plant a church. But that's not where Paul wanted to be. You know where Paul wanted to be? And I'm about to prove it to you. Paul wanted to be back in Thessalonica. He had a heart for the Thessalonians. We always talk about God give us a heart for a particular people group so that we can go and preach the gospel. Well, Paul had a heart for Thessalonica, and he wanted to get back to Thessalonica. But the Spirit of God said no. So Paul gets kicked out of Berea, and they put him on a boat, and they ship him all the way down to Athens. Paul doesn't want to be in Athens for two reasons. Nobody's with him. I'm about to show you that in the text. And they're absolutely godless and they worship all kinds of crazy gods in Athens. He doesn't want to be in Athens. He doesn't like to be alone. And he doesn't like to be around people who build gods with their own hands and bow down to him because that just is beyond weird to the Apostle Paul. Let me show you. Acts chapter 17, verse 13. He's in Berea. They love the, they love the word in Berea, but Paul doesn't want to be in Berea. He wants to be in Thessalonica. When the Jews of the Thess uh, Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and look, Silas and Timothy remained in Berea. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, 
and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, Paul left. Now, while Paul was awaiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Provoked is another word for, we would translate it, ticked. He's just really ticked. He was really not happy about this. He's in Athens. Silas and Timothy got left to Berea to go back to Thessalonica. I'll show you that in just a second. And he's stuck down here in Athens with nobody, doesn't have a clue of what's going on, and everybody's running around worshiping these funny little gods that they've made with their own hands. And he's like, this is just crazy. Okay? Now, Paul wants to go back to Thessalonica. The Thessalonica. Go to Thessalonians, chapter 1. This is where we understand that Paul spent more time in in Thessalonica than we realize. Let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. No, chapter 2. Yeah, let's start in chapter 2. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. You there? Having so fond of an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become so very dear to us. Paul fell in love with the Thessalonians. And he didn't want to leave Thessalonica. He didn't want to go to Berea. And he sure didn't want to go to Athens. And so what he does is he sends Silas and Timothy back up to Thessalonica to help take care of them. Now, one of the reasons that I believe Paul loved them so much is because they were persecuted so intensely for their faith in Christ. Let me show you this. Look at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this reason we constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators. Listen, here we go. You became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. I'll explain that in a minute. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. Now we're all the way back in Acts chapter 2. When Paul preached the gospel, Peter specifically, I'm sorry, in Judea, the Jews, some of them converted to Christ, Their own countrymen despised them for coming to faith in Christ. And so countrymen were persecuting countrymen. And for Paul, that was like civil war. That's like, that should not happen. And so the Jews were persecuting the Jews. And Paul was like, this is wrong. Why are you persecuting your own brothers? We've brought the good news of the gospel. Stop killing your brothers. Go forward to Thessalonica. They were, look back up in chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So what was going on in Thessalonica? They were worshiping false gods. So when the Thessalonians converted to Christ, guess who persecuted the Thessalonians? Their own countrymen that were worshiping false gods. So, you had Jews coming into Thessalonica persecuting Christians. You had Thessalonians persecuting their own countrymen. And Paul's saying, my heart is for you because you're being persecuted by your own people. Now, Paul was a what? A Jew. When Paul turned to faith in Christ, who kept persecuting Paul? The Jews. Paul had a heart for these people because these people were experiencing the very same thing that he experienced no matter where he went. Every time he ran into a Jew, a Jew hated Paul because Paul had converted to Christ. And Paul's like, my heart is for you. Bless your heart, your own countrymen. In some cases, your own family is persecuting you because you've decided to love Jesus. And now some of your own families, some of your own co-workers, some of your own friends that used to be with you are now persecuting you. And my heart is for you. Look at verse 15. Not only are you like me, but you're like the Lord. 
who both killed the Lord Jesus, the Jews, and the prophets and drove us out. And it reminded me of John chapter 1. He was sent to his own, but his own did not receive him. Right? So even the Lord Jesus was persecuted by his own people. All right? Now, let's get on down. Verse 17. This is how we know he wanted to go back. Brethren, we have been taken away from you for a short while in person, but not in spirit. We were all the more eager with great desire to see your face, for we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Now, if Paul ever slipped, I might suggest he slipped here. Because I think in his passion for the Thessalonians, he got so emotional he forgot just for a moment about the sovereignty of God. Yes, Satan might have hindered you from going back to Thessalonica, Paul, but ultimately, who was behind you not going back to Thessalonica? The sovereignty of God. You see, we like to sing about the sovereignty of God. We like to talk about the sovereignty of God. But when we experience things that we do not want to experience, we have a tendency to forget about the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over the good and the bad, Paul. And I, I don't know. I think he may have slipped here because he was a little bit emotional. He blamed it on Satan. God doesn't want him in Thessalonica. God wants him in Corinth. Okay? Now, look at what Paul does. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, Paul's in Athens, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. So the mission team got together and they said, Paul, we're going to leave you in Athens by yourself. He didn't like that idea. So we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that, you would, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer... I also sent out to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would have been in vain. And now that Timothy has come to us, okay, Timothy is caught back up with him. We're going to see that in Acts 18. And has brought to us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith and for now we really live. And so Silas and Timothy, go back to Acts now, finally rejoined Paul in Acts chapter 18. And Paul is so excited because Timothy and Silas come back and give them the report. Paul, I know you're worried about the Thessalonians, but listen, you've got to understand they're fine. They're faithful. Everything's okay. We need to keep going with the gospel. Okay? Which brings us to Acts 18, chapter 1. After these things... Now, I just talked 20 minutes and Luke summed it up in three words. I'm like, Luke, come on. You could have given us more than that. After these things... Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Okay, here we go. Back to the map. Here's Athens. It's going to go due west. I think it was about 50 miles to the capital city of Achaia, to Corinth, to plant a church who winds up being the singular church that gives Paul the most heartache of his entire life. They're always breaking Paul's heart. And I'm sure at some time Paul's like, Lord, let, let me go back up to Philippi. They love me. Or, and there's a rich lady there who's just paying for everything. And I just, we, Philippi would be a great church plan. Or let me go to Thessalonica because I have such a heart for that people group there, the Thessalonians. Let me go there. And God was like, no, we're going down here and you're going to hang out in Athens by yourself for a little while. I'm going to readjust your thinking and then I'm going to ship you to Corinth by yourself. Paul didn't want to do that. But when he gets to where God wants him to be, God goes nuts and starts providing for him. Look at Acts chapter 18, verse 2. Paul found, <laughs> isn't that a cute word for sovereignty? Paul found a Jew named Aquila. I think it's actually pronounced Aquila, but I've always pronounced it Aquila. 
in a, na a native of Pontus, having recently, more sovereignty, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Emperor Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome and he came to them and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, i.e. in their home and they were working together for by trade they both were tent makers. Now I want you to catch up. We got another couple. It's not as long as the journey, but we've got Aquila and Priscilla that live in Rome. Okay? Way over here. And remember, Paul is way over here when this whole thing starts. And Aquila and Priscilla are running a tent business, tent making business, in the capital city of Rome, way over here. Now, Emperor Claudius gets tired, and it's funny, in his history books, he wrote Christus. He misspelled Christus, Christ in Latin. He put an E instead of an I. He got fed up with them arguing about some guy named Crestus who was raised from the dead. Okay? So the Jews up in Rome are arguing with the converts to Christianity over Crestus or Christ. Emperor Claudius has had enough of all this infighting in his city. And so he says, all of you Jews have to leave. So he literally makes all the Jews, converted or not, leave Rome. I'm up to here with it, with all your arguing. So I've got this young couple, Aquila and Priscilla, who have a business, who are making money, who have a home, who have family, who have friends, and Emperor of Rome says, leave. You just grasp the weight of that for just a second. If you think God's concerned about where you've built a house and planted roots, He's not concerned about that. Because the only thing He's concerned about doing is what He's doing, not what you're doing. So let me just pause right here and let me warn you, don't plant your roots too deep. Don't dig your foundation so deep. You might be leaving. They left everything. And it's not like they got to drop a sign in the yard and put up a house for sale. They left everything and they lost everything. Okay? So here they go. They're in Rome. They have to leave. Got kicked out. They hop a boat. They're not following the red road. That's Paul's road. But let me suggest to you, they did follow the same path through here. They could not come through the region of here unless you wanted to die because you could not sell a ship through here. In fact, in Acts it tells us Paul goes to the lee side of Crete for that very reason. So you can see that there. So they didn't come around the south end. They probably came up here and they probably hiked it over to Corinth because they've got to get to a major city because what do they do for a living? They make tents. So they've got to start a whole new business and a whole new life all over again. So in God's sovereignty, Aquila and Priscilla get kicked out of Rome, something they don't like, and they get shipped to Corinth. They immediately go about the business of making tents. Paul walks into Athens with his head down. Nobody's with him, and he walks in the city of Corinth. He doesn't know what to do, and he just so happens to meet a young couple who's already been converted to Christ in Rome, who already has a tent-making business, that's what Paul does, and already has a place to live. You see, when you get to where God's trying to take you, you're going to find there's a whole lot of things already waiting on, on you that God has already provided for. And so Paul automatically has partners, okay? He automatically already has partners to do what he's come to do, and that's preach the gospel. Now, I'll go back to the text. He was reasoning in verse 4, in the synagogues, every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy, they finally make it back, came down from Macedonia, remember that region up top, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. So we basically got... Paul working six days a week preaching the gospel on the Sabbath. Now, Timothy and Silas come down. Paul goes full time. Why? Keep your finger there. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to show you something. I'm 
was thinking it's 2 Corinthians. I'm thinking that's not right, so just hold on just a second. I'm right. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11. Now keep in mind, Paul's in Corinth. Now he's writing this letter after the fact. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 7. Did I commit a sin, Paul says, in humbling myself while I was in Corinth so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge, meaning I made tents? Verse 8, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came, Timothy and Silas, came from Macedonia... They fully supplied my need, had enough money, and in everything I kept myself a burden to you and will continue to do so. So now back in Acts 5, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, they had enough money for the Apostle Paul to stop making tents and go preach the gospel. Now here's the question. Where'd they get the money? Where'd they get the money? Remember that rich lady in Philippi? That's where they got the money. Why did Paul stop off at Philippi to preach the gospel and plant a church? Because there was a rich lady there named Lydia who was going to help fund the rest of his mission efforts in Macedonia and Achaia. In fact, if you want to keep your finger in Acts 18 and go to Philippi, I mean Philippians, go to the last chapter of Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 4. Look at verse 15. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia and went down into Achaia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. You see, Paul finally got down to Corinth and he's having to work because he's run out of money and he's in need. And then all of a sudden, Timothy and Silas, who he told them to go back up into Thessalonica, somehow got hooked up back up with the church at Philippi. And that church loaded them up and sent them back to Paul. And now Paul's got enough money to continue doing the mission. See, there's reasons for things. And we get so frustrated because this didn't work and that didn't work. And why was I only here a short time? And why am I here now? And the whole thing is God's like going, just keep quiet. I'm doing something. And you won't figure it out till probably like 20 years from now. But if you'll just close your mouth, I've got this. All right? And I'm thinking about the people that have just have moved in. You know, why are you here this morning, Nathan? Don't know. Probably have a better idea 10 years from now. And you know, how long are you and Wallace going to be here? Don't know. 10 years from now, you'll know more. Sarah, how long are you going to be? 25, I think 25 more years you'll be here. And then you'll be gone. <laughs> and it'll make more sense to you. What am I doing here? Five and a half years now. I have no plans to leave whatsoever. But if I get kicked out, I'll have to. What was I doing here? I'll know a lot more about that in 10 years. Why'd you move to section? We're going to find out. God's sovereign. And it's going to be good. Why'd y'all adopt a little girl? Don't know yet. (laughs) We're going to find out a lot as she grows up. That's how God speaks and that's how God works and that's what God's doing. We can rest in the sovereignty of God. Now let's keep going. I know it's getting late, but let's keep going. This gets gets even better. Verse 5, But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Verse 6, But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments. He said to them, Your blood be on your own hands. I am clean. From now on I'll go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Now get this, Paul goes to the synagogue, he preaches the gospel, they kick him out. 
It quotes a passage from Ezekiel 33, which basically says, your blood's on your own hands now. I preach the gospel to you. Right next door to the synagogue is a man who converts to Christianity, and we have a church plant, a house plant, next door to the synagogue. That did not set well. They're holding church next door. Okay? Now let's keep going. Look at verse 8. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household, and now many, the door gets kicked open, of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. So, synagogue's next door. Crispus hears the gospel. He converts. He goes to the church right next door. That's a Christian church. Now, when the Corinthians figure out their leader at the synagogue converted to Christianity, all of a sudden, God kicks the door open at Corinth, and all kinds of people are coming to faith in Christ. Now, when all kinds of people start coming to faith in Christ, what usually happens to the Apostle Paul? Persecuted gets kicked out. Not this time. I want you in Corinth. This is what we've, this is what we've always been doing, Paul. I want you in Corinth. So look at what God says to him in verse 9. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. God is sovereign. And Paul settled there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. See, Paul, this is where I wanted you all along. You had that Macedonian vision so I could get you down to Corinth because I've already put Aquila and Priscilla there and they've already got things going because there's going to be a day when the synagogue re leader repents and comes to faith in Christ and once that happens, boom, the door's going to get kicked open and there's going to be all kinds of Corinthians come to faith in Christ. You're going to read First and Second Corinthians and that'll be used in the church to train the church for 2,000 years. I need you in Corinth. And by the way, while you're here, Nobody will harm you. Now, man, if that doesn't cut you loose, I don't know what will. Not a man will lay a finger on you. Go preach. I bet he went out and clicked his heels because finally I get to breathe and I get to preach and nobody's going to persecute me. I had to get him to Corinth. Now, interesting. Let's keep reading because I want you to see what happens to Priscilla and Aquila. God's not finished with them yet. It wasn't just about Corinth for them, all right? So I'll read fast. Verse 12. Now while Gallio, who didn't like Jews, was proconsul of Achaia, remember the Achaian region down here where Corinth is, he was proconsul over all that, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying... This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Okay, so after a year and six months, Paul finally gets called in on the judgment seat. Verse 14. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or of vicious crimes, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names in your own law, look out, look at after it yourselves, I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. Galileo didn't like Jews anyway. So when they get started to start arguing about Jesus and the resurrection and Jews, Galileo's like, dude, this is your own business. So in other words, when Paul stands up to give his defense in the judgment seat and God's already said, listen, you ain't got to worry about any of this, he literally opens his mouth to speak. And God was like, I told you I had this. Galileo interrupts him. We're done here. He never even has to speak because God is sovereign. We're done here. This is over. Now let me show you what happens next. Verse 16. He drove them away from the judgment seat and they took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. That would have normally been Paul's beating. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Paul, having remained many days longer after that, took leave of the brethren, put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila, and in Sincrea, he had his haircut, we're not going to worry about that, for he was keeping a vow. Okay, so we finally got Paul on the boat. Paul never had to speak in his defense. That had never happened. Paul's beating another man got, 
But it's interesting what God did through that beating. So keep your finger there. Turn the page to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. And look who else wound up going to Ephesus and hopping a boat. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Isn't that interesting? He was the leader of the synagogue. Now, whether he got beat because he was converted or whether he was beaten because he couldn't keep control over the synagogue, I have no idea. But somewhere before or after that beating, he converted to Christ and he moved to Corinth as a believer. I mean, he moved to Ephesus as a believer. Everybody was coming to faith in Corinth because that's where God wanted his church planted. Okay? Now, go back to Acts 18. Let's finish up the story real quick because I want to talk about Priscilla and Aquila. Verse 18. No, 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 no. Skip down to 19. They hopped a boat. They came to Ephesus. Now, look, here's Ephesus. Corinth, follow the purple line, hopped a boat. Ephesus. Okay? That's where we are. See that? All right, here we go. They came to Ephesus. He left them there. Now he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked Paul to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return if God's will, he set sail from Ephesus. And when he landed to Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and he went back down to Antioch. Now we're all the way back home, all the way over there on the right. Now Priscilla and Aquila. Having spent some time there, he left and passed successfully through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. He began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, Verse 26, very important. But when Priscilla and Aquila, those tent makers, heard him speak, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. He was getting it wrong. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, Ephesus, back to Corinth, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace at Corinth, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now let's talk about Aquila and Priscilla, and then we'll be done. We'll talk about you, and we'll be done. They're tent makers. They get kicked out of Rome. They go down to Corinth. They start making tents. They meet this guy named the Apostle Paul, and all of a sudden they're involved in the kingdom of God and the spread of the gospel, right? They leave Corinth because things kind of get heated and they go with Paul over to Ephesus. They get over to Ephesus and there's a guy there by the name of Apollos who's probably the best preacher in your Bible, by the way. He was a very eloquent, well-trained man. And the only thing he knew about was he knew about Jesus and he taught about Jesus, but he only knew about the baptism of John. I think he didn't understand grace and it actually says that in verse 27 because when he got to Corinth, he taught them about grace. I think he didn't understand grace alone. But that's, that's just me. But it is in verse 27. We don't know for sure. He's preaching it wrong. What we need to do as tent makers is call the Apostle Paul and let him straighten this out. No. What we need to do as tent makers who are followers of Christ is to pull this great preacher aside and show him the Word of God and teach him the Word of God more accurately. That's exactly what we need to do. That's exactly what you need to do. See, we've got this separation between preachers and we use the term lay people. That needs to go away. We're all uniquely gifted for the body of Christ. And if you spent time studying the Word of God, you have a responsibility to God. Anytime we hear somebody getting away from the truth of God is to pull them aside and correct them. Tent makers who we would call lay people, corrected the best preacher there is in Scripture. You see, that's how it's supposed to happen. Brother Don talks about one time 
they were at a huge associational meeting and this preacher got up I don't think he was the keynote speaker he got up and he preached and then the next guy up was some guy that had to do with Sunday school and so they just asked him to get up and share a little bit about how God had just worked miraculously through his Sunday school and his Sunday school had grown and grown and grown so he got up to share his story and he was saying you know I'll pick on Cody he was saying you know I just I just so appreciate he got up right behind the guy I so appreciate Cody's message this morning it was just really encouraging made some very fine points but let me encourage you brother the part that you said about this and this it was not correct because we know that in and he corrected him on the spot in a conference as graciously as possible and the guy was a Sunday school teacher and he was a pastor's conference and Don was sitting there going oh this is awesome this is awesome this is what we do you see we're not impressed by men we're impressed by the word of God and so that's what Priscilla and Aquila did now let's keep going I'm sorry 1 Corinthians chapter 16 look what else those tent makers did okay 1 Corinthians 16. Paul is in Ephesus. He's writing a letter to Corinth. Look what he says in 16 verse 19. The churches of Asia greet you, namely Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla, Prisca is her former name, I mean formal name, Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. I thought they were tent makers. No, they're church planners, you see. You see, they'll correct the best preacher there is, and then they'll move to Ephesus, start building tents, and plant a church. At some point in their life, they moved back to Rome. Remember where they were originally from? Don't know when that happened, but turn back to Romans. Go to your left. Look at the last chapter of the book of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 16. Now, let me, let me remind you, we've covered like a 30-year span, okay? This, these things weren't happening overnight. Look at chapter, uh, Romans 16, verse 3. You there? Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. He's writing a letter to Rome. For, for who, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also to all the churches of the Gentiles, also greet the church that is in their house. They moved back to Rome. And when they went back to their tent-making business, what did they do in Rome? They planted a house church. In other words, no matter where they were, they planted a church. And they didn't wait on a preacher to do it. You don't need a preacher to do it. If you've been diligent to study the Word of God, you don't need a preacher to plant a church. You need to get that in your mind. This is not preacher business. It's Christian business. Amen. And you just think about the people that have moved, moved out of here. Max and Allison. We should have went to prayer. We might have needed to plant a church in Mississippi. Think about Megan and Noah that are moving out of here, moving to Chattanooga next month. We need to pray about that. We might need to plant a church in Chattanooga. We don't need a preacher. We've got Noah and Megan. You thought about this? I hadn't thought about this until I studied this. we got Andrew and Emily moving to Tuscaloosa. They're looking for a church right now. They might not need to find a church. Corinth might need to plant a church in Tuscaloosa. And if gospel needs to preach anywhere, it needs to be in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You know what kind of attitude you need to have? <laughs> I heard it out of Travis's mouth yesterday. We went to visit Travis and Emily. I sat down in their den. Y'all need to go down to their house and sit in their den. Dude, it's so nice. It's just, the couch is nice. The rock fireplace is nice. The TV is large. And I just sat there and I just dreamed for a second. And I told, I told Travis, I said, man, I could sit here for a long time. And he said, our door is always open. You want to plant a church, that's the attitude you need to have. My door's open. And he's letting family in. He's letting foster kids in. He's letting anybody that wants to walk through that. The door's unlocked. Come on in. And, and, and when, he, when he said that, I remembered what Steve McDougall said. Our, our, our home is always open. They have people coming off the streets, and they, you know, if they don't have a bed, here, here's a sleeping bag. 
just sleep on the floor and they've had people stay for months so they get their feet back on the ground. It, it's an open door. Listen, you don't need a preacher. You need to understand God is moving in and through your lives and He is sovereign and He's going to move some of you and I don't want you to go but He's going to move some of you. Paul didn't want to leave Thessalonica. Thessalonica. He didn't want to leave there but he had to go. And we get moved here and there and we have to remind ourselves whether we like it or not, it's the sovereignty of God and He's up to something. He's doing good. And wherever He sends you, the first thing you need to be asking yourself, God, do I need to plant a church right here? Because the answer is probably, yeah. And if you say, I can't do that, that's exactly where you need to be. No, you can't. But He might want to. And that might be the very thing He's going to do. So, this has really changed my thinking, y'all. Because we've been talking about missions and we've been talking about trying to get to Myanmar and all this stuff. We don't have anybody in Myanmar. I got somebody in Mississippi. I got somebody in Chattanooga. I'm about to have somebody in Tuscaloosa. God knows where else. That's why we need to be praying about. Because wherever Priscilla and Aquila went, neither one of them were preachers. Especially Priscilla, they were Baptists. Aquila was the preacher, right? They planted a church. Now this is what I want you to do when we're finished. Spend some time. Look back over the last... If you're Eddie, you can look back over the last 70 years of your life. For the rest of you, you can look back over the last 10 or 15 years of your life. And realize what God has done. I was in... I was four miles down the road, y'all. And God had to get me here. And so to get me here, he moved me. How far is it? 2,600 miles to Portland <laughs> for two years because he wanted to show me how to handle the Word of God. And y'all, I'm talking as soon as the light bulb went on and I understood the sufficiency of Scripture for all things, we were moving back home. So I moved 2,600 miles back to section and then the phone rings and I passed your church four miles down the road. Sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God. Did I really want to leave Portland? No. We're going back in July just to visit for two years. The kids are going, to Washington. It's Washington. It's two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Did I say two years? That could be fun. Yeah, it would. It would. But you know what? You'd be all right. Because we're in a much different place than we were five and a half years ago because of the grace of God. You would be all right. That's how God works, man. We, we can't figure Him out. He's doing what He's doing in the good and the bad, and every bit of it has purpose. Our only question needs to be, God, what are you doing? And if you lose your job tomorrow and get fired, get in your car and shout, praise God. You're up to something and I can't wait to see what it is. That's the attitude we need to have.